Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Swartney. I am a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Iowa, where I also direct the Center for Health Effects of Environmental Contamination. If you've looked in the news lately about drinking water, you, perhaps you've heard about PFAS chemicals. And with all the information that's out there, we thought it might be useful to do a bit of a brief explainer as to what they are and how they might affect you here in Iowa. And so PFAS is actually an abbreviation that stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, two of the most common PFAS chemicals that you might hear about are PFOA and PFOS, which are shown here. Uh, these chemicals are characterized by their widespread presence of fluorine, uh, represented by the F in those chemical structures on this slide. Um, PFOA and PFOS get their name from how we group PFOS chemicals based on their size. And so uh, you see octane or octanoic in their name. That's actually a reference to the length of the carbon chain that makes them up. And so there's eight carbons and that's where that octane comes from. Um, and so, but in reality that PFOS themselves are actually a large family of about 3000 or more human made fluorinated chemicals. Um, they vary primarily based on their size. I talked about how PFOA and PFOS have eight carbon chains. Um, other PFAS generally have shorter chains. And so, for example, here in this table, this is the list of a subset of the family of PFAS chemicals that the EPA has developed a standard test method for that allows them to measure the presence of PFAS in water or, or other uh, substances like soil. And they all vary based off of, again, the length of their carbon chain. And they all then have a similar acronym that somehow links back to that. And so it, it's a little bit complicated and a bit of an alphabet soup. But when we think about PFAS, there are the two major ones that we know a lot about, PFOS and PFOA but there's actually so much more and there's more that we're discovering um, day after day because of their ubiquitous use in industry and commerce. And so PFAS uh, have been around for a long time. They were first invented in the 30s and patented and they have a lot of favorable characteristics that impart things like oil and water repellency, temperature resistance and friction reduction. And as a result of that, they're used in a wide variety of consumer goods. Probably most of us are familiar with PFAS through their use in nonstick cookware. So anything that's been made with Teflon has used these fluorinated chemicals. Other things like fast food packaging that are uh, created to be grease resistant, those have been made with PFAS. And they also make an excellent fire suppressant. So most firefighting foams that are used by firefighters are, have been historically based off perfluorinated chemicals um, and derivatives, uh, starting first with PFOS and PFOA, but as we realized those were problematic and have started to phase them out, we've moved on to other of these shorter chain PFAS chemicals in our firefighting foams. If you've seen headlines about PFAS in the news, you've likely heard, that, uh, heard them referred to by their nickname forever chemicals. And they've gotten this nickname because they are quite persistent in the environment. They're very difficult to break down. It's hard to destroy them and make them completely go away. Um, and so we have to be concerned about them because if they persist in the environment, it's a question of where do they go and where do they accumulate? And unfortunately, because of their widespread use in consumer products, we've all been exposed to PFAS chemicals at some point. Um, in fact, the, the US CDC and the ATSDR, which is the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, have noted that most people in the United States have um, PFAS chemicals in their blood as a result of our exposure and their ability to persist and accumulate within us. Um, and primarily PFOS and PFOA. These longer chain PFAS chemicals are very persistent and like to accumulate in things like, um, unfortunately, humans and, and other areas um, like soil and, and, and water. And so where do PFAS comes from? And so this is a great slide that sort of artic or, or, or graphic that illustrates you know, the, the PFAS cycle that came from uh, a group down here and all the links are available and these slides will be available if you'd like to look at them. But they're, they're human made chemicals. And so all PFAS has been derived through um, industries that have produced them. And in, historically, maybe they've directly discharged into water and that their waste and that's how our water has become contaminated or perhaps they've pushed their wastewater to a wastewater treatment plant. I've talked briefly already about one of the other major sources is firefighting foam. These are good suppressants. So anywhere there've been fire training facilities or places like airports that have been required to have 
fire suppression systems on site have become important sources of PFAS chemicals to the environment because of their use of firefighting foams. Wastewater treatment plants play an important role. A lot of the consumer goods that we have that contain PFAS, we, we, we might push them down the drains, they might receive industrial waste. And we know that PFAS chemicals are only partially removed during wastewater treatment. The water that's treated, it could still contain PFAS and be discharged back into the environment where it can contaminate our water supplies. And we also know that uh, sludge, uh, what we call the residual solids or byproducts of the wastewater treatment end up in the landfill. And so the landfills become an important source of PFAS in the environment, both from consumer goods that we dispose that contain these chemicals, as well as the residuals from wastewater treatment that uh, they receive. We should also not ignore that wastewater treatment plants sometimes use some of that residual and they give it to local farmers to use as soil amendment on which crops are produced. And this ends up leading to some of the major routes of exposure in terms of drinking water, uh, food products that might have been uh, raised on contaminated soil with PFAS or potentially that had been amended with those biosolids. There's also the potential for air transport if there's emissions from its uh, production, as well as any of the exposures we get to consumer goods, say like through food and food packaging. But despite the fact that you could potentially inhale PFAS if you're near a, a production site, or you might come into contact with it through clothes that have been stain resistant or food that's been in that packaging, the dominant human exposure route that we worry about is consumption of contaminated drinking water. And so the PFAS would be readily absorbed into the gastrointestinal tract and they can quickly get into the blood. And so one of the best ways we can avoid getting exposure is, is minimizing uh, any drinking, you know, exposure or consumption of drinking water that's been contaminated. Um, and so this ends up being something where it really is important to know whether or not you might have water that's been affected by PFAS. There are a variety of health outcomes and, and the populations that are most vulnerable end up being pregnant women, uh, developing uh, fetuses and infants. And there's a variety of, of unwanted health impacts that can affect um, particularly early life, low-term birth weight, preterm birth, um, pregnancy-induced hypertension, high blood pressure, and a variety of others, including um, immune suppression. We're still understanding and gaining more knowledge on the totality of health effects that come from PFAS chemicals. So there's a variety of other health effects that have been uh, particularly or potentially associated with exposure, but we're still developing understanding of what those links are and how strong the link is between PFAS exposure and these other uh, uh, effects. But the one thing that we do know is that these effects can happen at very low levels of exposure. And so while PFAS chemicals are not yet regulated in drinking water, the EPA has established a non-enforceable health advisory of, of 70 nanograms per liter for the combined amount of PFOA and PFOS in drinking water. And we sometimes refer to, P, to nanograms per liter uh, with the nomenclature parts per trillion. And this is a pretty low level, particularly when we think about what we regulate in our drinking water. Most drinking water regulations are set at about a thousand fold higher in what we call part per, per billion levels. And so we're really looking at effects through potential exposures to PFOS and PFOA that are quite low compared to the things we typically worry about in our drinking water supply. So where do we have vulnerabilities then? And so one of the biggest vulnerabilities in my mind for drinking water are private wells that are unregulated, that are near a known uh, source of PFAS in the environment. And so uh, you can look at the headlines. So if you know you're near an industrial site or perhaps a historical industrial site that's been shut down due to its environmental contamination, wells near those have been found at risk. Near landfills, since we know landfills can be a source, private wells are vulnerable potentially there. And anywhere we've been using firefighting foam that would contain PFAS, we have the potential for there to be contamination of adjacent wells. And so whether that's airports, which have to have had to have fire suppression systems or near firefighting training facilities, these would be potentially high risk areas if you had a well that was prone to contamination. If you're on a community, community supply that's regulated by the EPA, um, again, PFAS isn't yet regulated in water. The EPA is moving in that direction. And as a result, most of these community water systems, the municipalities that might serve large cities, 
or, or, or bigger communities and towns are starting to test for PFAS and working towards where there might be a regulation put in place. Some of this testing is set to take place in 2023 and 2025, but states are also moving much faster than that, including here in Iowa. So you should be aware that this, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources has developed their own PFAS action plan. And their focus area number one, as their primary focus, is to identify and minimize exposure of Iowans to PFAS in public drinking water. And there's prioritized testing for what they've considered higher risk facilities uh, that are serving communities that should begin in 2021 because there have been, based on DNR's estimation, about 1,100 sites in Iowa that PFAS has been either used or potentially stored. And they've used that to then prioritize where there might be community water systems nearby that could be at risk. So what can you do? Uh, if you are served by a public water supply, I would encourage you to contact your community water provider and inquire about their plans for testing. They should be able to talk to you about their interactions with the DNR as they think about how to move forward with assessing the risks of PFAS in Iowa. If you're on a private well, I would encourage you to assess your vulnerability based off, do you live any, near any of these sites that we know are historically causing problems for private wells when it comes to PFAS contamination? And if you were concerned, then contact your local county public health department. Free testing for PFAS could be available through the Iowa Grants to Counties program, which is used for testing water quality in wells. The standing health advisory set by the EPA should allow funds through grants to counties to cover PFAS testing. And then all Iowans should be encouraged to visit the DNR's PFAS website to read through and become acquainted with their action plan. Testing is available for a fee to all Iowans through the State Hygienic Laboratory for their drinking water, but there is a, a cost associated with that. And there are options for in-home water treatment like reverse osmosis systems that have proven most effective at removing PFAS if you are concerned about any potential exposure you might be getting through your drinking water. So thank you very much for your attention. You are welcome to send questions to me at my email address uh, or call at my office phone number, or you're welcome to visit the website for the Center for Health Effects of Environmental Contamination to learn more about what we do and reach out to us for, with your inquiries. Thank you. Thank you.